When David Carradine died in 2009, he was no longer a household name, a bona fide television superstar in the 1960s with shows like Shane and Kung Fu. His career stalled for the next several decades, and though he had a bit of a resurgence when he was cast as Bill in Quentin Tarantino's Kill Bill Volumes 1 and 2, he never again approached the same level of fame. Yet, when details of Carradine's death emerged in June 2009, it quickly became the biggest celebrity story in the world, not, as we've noticed, because of his level of fame. Instead, it was the manner of his death that took the world by storm and gave rise to one of Hollywood's great tales of sex and misfortune, allegations of murder, and an international search for the truth amidst the madness. I'm Jason Beckerman. I'm Derek Kaufman. And this is Last Days, David Carradine. So, Jason, before we get started, we should point out that this episode is definitely not for children or for the faint of heart. Frankly, it has discussions of certain sexual proclivities that may not be for everyone. But if you stick around, we promise to tell you an absolutely fascinating story. On May 31st, 2009, David Carradine arrived in Bangkok, Thailand to film the final scenes of a movie he was shooting called Stretch. Uh, David Carradine was very active in his later years after Kill Bill, has a very long IMDb, always had projects in the works, and it, it, the same is true towards the end of his life. Filming had gone on for months, and the cast and crew were now in Thailand, where shooting was scheduled to wrap at the end of the week. Four days after he arrives, on June 3rd, Carradine, who's staying at this swanky hotel, it's called the Swiss Hotel Nye Lert Park, uh, planned to have dinner with his assistant and some others at a local restaurant. Never showed up. An hour later, Carradine calls the assistant and apologizes for standing him up and says, hey, if I can still come meet up with the group, I'd love to do so. But he was told they were already across town. So Carradine decided to stay in. What happened next, Eric, has been a matter of debate and speculation ever since. But here are the things that we know for certain. The next morning, so Carradine doesn't show up for dinner. The next morning, a chambermaid enters Carradine's room and discovered his body. He was in his closet, naked, except for a blonde wig and fishnet stockings. His hands were bound together and attached to a metal bar that spanned the top of the closet. His body was laced in an intricate web of ropes. He had a gold rope around his neck and a black shoelace tied securely around his genitals. And that rope, the one around his genitals, was attached to the one around his neck at his mid-body. His neck had broken in one place and his neck-length hair was matted in blood. And laid out on the bed was women's lingerie, red, apparently unworn. News of his death broke later that day, and there were immediately these conflicting reports about what had happened. Remember, this is Bangkok, Thailand. This is not a death in the United States, so there's always going to be some international intrigue when a celebrity of his magnitude passes away overseas. The police officials in Thailand were slow to release the details. They're not used to these big celebrity stories in the same way a death in L.A. would take place. And when they did speak, they initially gave what could only be described as sort of an incomplete and inaccurate description of what they found. They said Carradine was discovered hanging, naked, with a rope around his neck, and that he appeared to have committed suicide in that closet in the hotel room. Those reports omitted all of the details about the fishnets, the wig on his head, and the rope tied around his genitals at the time. Uh, Many people in the media ascribed the Thai government's initial lack of transparency, sort of them withholding these uh, sort of key details about the case to the country's antiquated views on sex. Now, we can't do a podcast about David Carradine dying in Bangkok, Thailand, without talking a little bit about what Thailand is all about and what its reputation was in the world community in this regard. It had a, you know, Thailand has a well-earned reputation as a destination for sex tourism, and there's a prominent role of gay and transgender people in pop culture that comes from Thailand uh, in, in particular. It's just a big part of the culture, and particularly in Bangkok, their big urban centers. Right. Uh, Thai law, however, doesn't necessarily reflect the pop culture of Thailand, so the law is actually a bit retrograde. It, it condones wholesale discrimination in employment, housing, education, health care, uh, and even open conversations about matters such as transgenderism and, and uh, homosexuality. homosexuality in the country itself. So it has this mix of this sort of uh, illicit underworld in the cities, but the actual laws in the country are quite backwards. Yeah, and these topics are really taboo among many in Thailand, especially the ruling elite. And so it's against this backdrop that the Thai police are confronted with the death of an American celebrity dressed in women's undergarments, a blonde wig, 
found hanging in his swanky hotel room closet with ropes tied around his genitals. They're confronted with this against the backdrop of the kind of culture that you just described. Which these rulers, you can imagine it being an embarrassing spectacle for the country that everyone has these preconceived notions about Thailand and its prostitution and having a celebrity die in sort of these uncommon circumstances. So it it really is any wonder why the Thai officials were quick to rule Carradine's death a suicide and omit those tawdry details. But many of Carradine's closest friends immediately issued categorical denials that David Carradine killed himself. They just said they, they know him too well. They knew the man, and he just wasn't the guy and guy who commit suicide. And we're going to listen to a clip real quick. It's from Larry King Live. And the voices you're going to hear are in order. Michael Madsen, who was uh, his co-star in Kill Bill, a friend of Carradine's. Uh, and he's actually, you'll hear him reference to somebody named Annie. That's Carradine's current wife at the time that he died. He was married five times. His fifth wife, Annie. Quentin Tarantino, the director uh, of uh, of Carradine's and Kill Bill, and also a very close friend, and then his, and then one of his better friends, Rob Schneider, a co-star in a couple of movies. You're going to hear those three voices in this clip. I don't think he was suicidal by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, I None. Don't you don't think so at all. Yeah, I, I got. Well, I talked to Annie about that, yeah. and she said that you know, the most important thing that she wanted everybody to know is that David was not suicidal, that he wasn't depressed, and that he wasn't going to about to do something like that, especially when he had a job and working. Yeah, I mean, the thing about it is, I mean, that's the thing that I really just can't get my head around because there might have been a period of David's long life that he could have been suicidal, but this wasn't the time. Well, there's, there's no way that David, and Chuck will tell you, there's no way that David killed himself. I mean, he, this guy had everything going for him. He had a beautiful young family, people who really loved him, and he was really in an upswing. Turns out they were all right. Contrary to those initial reports out of Thailand, which situated this as a man who committed suicide in a hotel room, David Carradine did not commit suicide. This much we know. By all accounts, the Thai government attempted to suppress these salacious details, but the facts just couldn't stay hidden. David Carradine's a very famous person with very famous friends who are out in the media immediately. This was on the 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 interview you just listened to was very shortly was the day after his after death. he yeah. passed, and so immediately his friends come out and say this is not at all in his character, and they refute this story, and then everything starts to unravel. There's a preliminary autopsy that's performed in Bangkok uh, the following week after his death, and the Thai coroner wasn't nearly as bashful in the description of what happened as those initial report. He publicly, for the first time you hear this, and accurately describes the scene in Carradine's room and the closet, the fishnet stockings, and he confirms at this point in time that the cause of death was asphyxiation and said there was no evidence to suggest that Carradine intended to take his own life. So you've now got the suicide story is out the window. That's initially how they wanted to present it, maybe for the reasons to protect the country's reputation. But now we know that he died of asphyxiation and didn't kill himself. And then come forward Gail Jensen and Marina Anderson. These are David Carradine's. Remember, we said he had been married five five times at the time of his death. He was married to his fifth wife. His third and fourth wives, Gail Jensen and Marina Anderson, come out, and they speak of Carradine's, Carradine's longtime obsession with autoerotic asphyxiation, which, just so we get it out there, it's defined as the intentional restriction of oxygen to the brain for the purposes of sexual arousal. Gail Jensen, in particular, told a story about when she saved his life during their marriage when she came home to find him unconscious with a belt around his neck and she was able to come in and rescue him just in the nick of time and she described a man by who with by any measure had extreme sexual taste Jensen just said Carradine would spend out days planning different methods of autoeroticism many of which would include multiple trips to the hardware store to buy instrumentation. And significantly for the death investigation, Jensen said that Carradine had perfected various methods of tying his own hands to the point that he couldn't release them. He knew how to tie his own hands to a bar, for example, and have them locked in place so he could actually not get out of them and he wouldn't have a fail safe. He would rely on others, specifically his wives, all of whom apparently knew about his habits, to come down and unlock him when he was ready to be released from the restraints. So now we're starting to get a picture. I mean, as you said, he was married several times, Gail Jensen and Marina Anderson. We do have to take their accounts with somewhat of a grain of salt. These are former wives, but they are intimate accounts that have lots of specific details about the man who they were married to. And I want to go back just real quick. So so when Larry King is interviewing the these three men, uh, Michael Madsen, Quentin Tarantino, and Rob Schneider in the wake of his death, there's some really interesting interactions where 
Larry King, who's totally unaware of Carradine and has never interviewed him At least before, outside of whatever, acting. Yes. Outside of acting, says to these guys, can you believe this had happened? And you can tell by the looks on these three guys' faces, all of whom knew, who knew Carradine, Although they, they simply said he didn't commit suicide, they were very sort of They're cagey. squirmy. They're, They're squirmy, squirmy because they know very well that Carradine has some weird tastes. Look, and so Larry King's asking them, can you believe this has happened? What do you think happened? And you, in the backs of their minds, you can see it in their eyes knowing what happened. They're thinking, well, we kind of have an idea what he was up to. Yeah, and it's interesting because Larry King is so great at those interviews. I do miss yeah. Larry King as well. But Quentin Tarantino is, is not a man who is easily blanches at... Uh, no, he's sexual peccadillos. Very, very he's famous very outward, loves feet. Yes, exactly. So yeah. he's he, the the body language in this clip is sort of they they sort of what's going on in their mind about their friend who has just we, passed we away. We don't want to out him on Larry King, but we know where this whole thing is going to going to run. And frankly, and then the ex wives come out and they just do what yeah. what Quentin and Rob were probably thinking. And, at and the frankly, time. This, this sort of lends to the conclusion that we all were drawing at that moment. I think his friends were as well, which is just this was just auto eroticism gone wrong. He had he had just accidentally hanged himself. It's not suicide. You, right. you have to have intention to kill yourself for suicide. But he had just killed himself through autoeroticism. That's right. And that starts to fix in the public's imagination because you because the suicide story is out the window. Now everyone, he becomes basically the poster child for autoerotic as- asphyxiation, which had been a term that was around pre-David Carradine. There was there were mentions and rumors of it with Michael Hutchins's death yes. as well. He was the lead singer of In Excess who had died many years prior prior, but it was much it was under also, much different circumstances, not in a Thai hotel. Pop, pop culture. I remember an episode of Weeds where um who's a guy from SNL, who was in the weeds. Kevin Nealon. Kevin Nealon does a famous autoerotic scene, the whole thing. So it was in pop culture a little bit, but here it's really crystallized. This is now ascribed as the reason that David Carradine death died, but maybe not so fast. Yeah, here's where the plot really thickens. So that is what everyone sort of believes happened at that time when the when the ex-wives come out and tell their stories. But in the next few days and weeks, a number of things happen that call the theory of accidental asphyxiation into question. Because remember, we've got suicide out the window. He didn't intentionally kill himself. But everyone sort of thought he died by going too far with the autoerotic right. asphyxiation, passing out and dying. First, there were a lot of few. There were a lot of interesting things, though, that happened with his death that started to make people suspect there may have been foul play. First, with Carradine's body now back in the United States, his family commissions a second autopsy by a pathologist named Michael Bodden. Now, Michael Bodden is a very famous forensic pathologist. He's testified in the O.J. Simpson trial. He's a very famous celebrity pathologist, right? Basically, he's like a celebrity, a corner of the stars where they hire to bring in and and go through the second guess the the public corners. Type his name into YouTube, you'll get. (laughs) Tons of videos. He loves to talk, so he would be all over a case like this. He investigated the JFK and MLK assassinations. He's involved in countless high-profile cases. Bodden completes the autopsy of, of David Carradine, and this causes a stir. He asserts that the Thai officials had withheld critical information which prevented a definitive finding of what had happened. He also noted that on David's body there was a, quote, red oval mark on his left forearm, which many believed looked like a defensive wound. Now the theories start to proliferate that there could have been someone else in the room who caused his death. Second, and this is another big factor in in the way this was presented to the media, Mark Garagos gets involved. Tell us what Mark does. Well, first of all, who is and Mark who Garagos? is Mark Garagos? He's a famed celebrity attorney. We have covered him on TMZ a, a, a million times. He's also a sort of a world-renowned shit stirrer. Mark Garagos, and he's now— By his own admission, By his own admission, that. right. He, 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 he knows is, how to get a headline. He is hired by the brothers of David Carradine to basically keep the investigation into his death in the public sphere. A lot of this happens a lot of times, that, that people with a little bit of money will hire— big name people who can get on Larry King, get on other news programs to maintain a conversation, which often spurs law enforcement. We'll get into that in just a second. Spurs law enforcement to keep investigations going. I remember the death of Natalie Holloway down in the Caribbean. There was a lot of talk about that. Her family hired these these publicity agents to get out there and continue talking about it, putting pressure on the government to keep the investigation alive, else you look like you're trying to cover it up. So this is the tactic that Garagos uh, really employs here, too. So he goes on Larry King Live, and he cites conflicting reports about what happened in Thailand, which leads him and others to believe that Carradine may have been murdered. Specifically, Garagos talks about how Thai authorities were frustrating the family search for answers and that there were suspicions that the death was connected to the Thai, quote, martial arts underground. 
which is <laughs> wild stuff. I mean, remember, uh, David Carradine was most famous for his role in Kung Fu, and now you've got theories floated about him being murdered by a martial arts underground in Thailand. You couldn't write this stuff. And so Garagos and others now are saying that the Thai investigators were making every effort to paint Carradine as a sexual deviant who accidentally killed himself because they didn't want to acknowledge that a well-heeled tourist was murdered by martial arts gangs. And, and you can see it, right? An economy that is built on Western tourism can't afford the kind of press. In, indeed, in the days after Carradine's death, a picture of his dead body leaked from the coroner's office. It shows him in the fishnets. It shows him in the blonde wig. It shows the blood matted uh, hair. And it really does sort of, you know, it, it, the fact they release this really does, and Garagos pointed this out, it shifts the focus from any wrongdoing or any attempts to slow play this up from the Thai government onto the deviance that David Carradine was expressing through his sexual proclivities. You know, and at the, so at the same time, you know, Car Garagos is also spurring the family to go to the FBI. And the FBI actually takes some note in this case, which is weird because it happens tens of thousands of miles away, well outside of their jurisdiction. And it seems like a pretty open and shut case, but the FBI gets involved a little yeah, bit. Yeah, and, and in my opinion, there is a reason the FBI gets involved. And here we have to pause because... We have to talk about who David Carradine is. As Jason noted at the outset, his best days were behind him. He was known for Kung Fu and, and had that resurgence with Kill Bill. But he actually comes from a widely decorated family of actors. The Carradine family is populated by Robert Carradine, his brother, who was in The Revenge of the Nerds. Keith Carradine, his, his other brother, who was in Nashville and Deadwood. He's the uncle of Martha Plimpton. You ever seen Goonies? Yeah, yeah. So this is a and family. son of John Carradine. His father was a very famous sort of country western actor back, back in the day. And Dates back to Country Cecil B. Western, DeMille. Western uh, he yeah. played Dracula in Cecil B. DeMille <laughs> movies back in the day. So this is a this is a very important Hollywood family. And when these brothers who are represented by Mark Garagos get involved, you have to sort of start to think about their motivations as well. Remember, the Thai government said suicide initially. Their motivation was to protect the reputation of the country. Uh, once it became thought of as an autoerotic asphyxiation death, his family trots in and says, oh, he was murdered. Because right. they're trying to move the narrative, narrative away from sexual deviance to protect the integrity of the their family and the FBI, look, these are federal uh, sort of officials, but they're also movie fans as well. So they're taking interest in looking into this yeah, as well. High profile because it's a high cases profile get case. a little more attention than low profile, profile cases do. We, we all know that's a, a, a truism. But others took up this mantle by suggesting Carradine may well have been mar uh, murdered. First and foremost about among them is Marina Anderson, his Third, fourth ex-wife, a lot of ex-wives we talked about earlier, and she she did a podcast and wrote a book where she lays out a pretty good case with evidence suggesting that he may in fact have been killed. I, I find this fascinating because when Garagos first comes out and says the martial arts gang, it sounds. A little racist, I'll be honest. He's, yeah. he's killed in, in, in an Asian country and the guy's yeah. bringing up martial arts. But what Marina Anderson lays out actually starts to sound like a real case that should be investigated. So first she points out that Carradine himself and his other ex-wives have said similar things was an expert at tying himself up, and he never put his life at risk. If you think about this guy, she said she saw him use ropes around his neck in a manner that would cause a, 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 you know pressure that would help satisfy him, but never to the extent where he could actually pass away from this. Well, there's an important point here. She says there were pressure abrasions, and that's explained that, that explains the blood that had caked in his head, head, that the rope had cut into his neck to the point that actually blood was streaming down his neck and into his hair, which is neck length, so it's not like it went up into his skull. Um, and but someone who has these sexual predilections wouldn't uh, apply so much force into a And she said he would never do something like that. The only time he used true pressure was when there was somebody else there, and he would never alone use the kind of pressure. He knew, this is a man who knew what he was doing. Even had he passed out, it wouldn't be the kind of ropes and create the ligature marks and create the deep impressions in his neck that would cause bleeding. She said he just wouldn't do that. Second, she's found, she says the shoelaces around his generals just don't, don't add up. Yeah, so Marina says those shoelaces, remember there's a black shoelace tied around his general, genitals. Uh, they said they, she said they weren't even from his shoes, something that the Thai investigators also noted in their initial reports. You know, David Carradine was there shooting a movie, he had other pairs of shoes, and apparently this pair of black laces wasn't pulled out of an existing shoe. Uh, yet there were no suggestions that he had attempted to purchase shoelaces in Thailand either. 
Third, she says David Carradine always traveled with his vintage Patek Philippe watch, a very expensive these watch. These are worth at least hundreds of thousands, hundreds sometimes of thousands. millions of dollars if they're, if they're rare. So these are insanely expensive watches. That's right. And wads of cash, both of which, neither of which were found at the death scene. So you don't have his watch that he's always traveling with, and he doesn't have large amounts of cash. You start to think about a potential robbery situation or a theft of some sort. Fourth, Anderson said she initially learned from the Thai officials that they had found a lone footprint on the bed which did not match David Carradine's. But that was omitted from all future public statements and didn't appear in any so governmental report. she says report. she hears about this but footprint on it. the bed, and then later they just simply omit this lone footprint, which she says did not match Carradine's shoes, that's on the bed. And how does a lone footprint initially exist and then no longer exists when the official reports come out? Ultimately, Anderson said that she's not tr- she's totally unsure about who killed her husband, suggesting it could have been anything from a gang of men to a lone prostitute seeking to rob him. But she is adamant that he was murdered and the Thai government did everything it could to cover it up. Here she is talking on a podcast while promoting a book about her life with Carradine. It's, it was amazing to both of us that there are still people that held a grudge against him for stealing the role of Kung Fu, Kwai Chen Kane, away from Bruce Lee. Maybe it was some weirdo that, you know, had a grudge and, and was, had a lady boy in the room or something. Who knows? Um, or it was for theft. Um, it, it could be a number of reasons. The person who came to me via another connection um, said that one of the people in the room um, was supposed to be related to a government official and that they covered up. And that's why they positioned him the way they did in the closet to make it look like it was something else. But all, all that said, Derek, it is really important to po- point out that Thai officials, the only ones to actually conduct an investigation into what happened in Thailand, have never made any findings of foul play at all. And in fact, every piece of evidence put forward by Anderson has been uh has been examined and there are innocent explanations for all of them. Yeah, if you think about it, she laid out those four points. If you take them in turn, first she said um, he knew better than to ever put his life at risk. He was very handy with ropes. He had a long history of uh, sort of dabbling in these sexual acts. Uh, But that's directly contradicted by his third wife, Gail Jensen. Remember, he was married five times, so the different wives have different things to say. And she said that she had once before found him unconscious uh, with a belt around his neck and had to save his life. So this starts to seem consistent with a guy who was really riding the edge and would push the boundaries for his own sexual arousal and satisfaction. And it's possible that he applied too much pressure in this instance and and ultimately uh, met his end. And the second one, the shoelace theory, kind of breaks down pretty easily, right? We don't know if he packed a shoelace in the suitcase. They said there's no evidence. She, Marina Anderson said there was no evidence that he bought it from somebody in Thailand, but it's impossible to know. Impossible. I mean, there's so many places shoe to store. procure shoelaces. So, he could have had one in his pocket. So this remember, is... this is a man who had intended to go out that night. When he finds out he can't go out, he just sort of says, well, you know what I can do by myself? I'm alone in a hotel room for the next 10 hours. Uh, you know, there's something I enjoy doing. Here it is. How do I get the means to do it? It's easily accessible, right? Shoelaces are the kind of thing you can get. You Ultimately, you can't put that much weight on a, on a shoelace. Maybe he didn't want to pull them out of his existing shoe. Maybe he wanted the he had a shoelace that he used for this. You just can't put that much stock in that. Is it a little bit curious? Yes, but there's a lot of innocent explanations. Third, um, she put a lot of emphasis on him not having his Patek Philippe watch and no cash being found in the room. But there's also a very logical explanation for this. Maybe he knew going to Thailand, it was an unsavory part of, uh, you know, sort of the country, or, and he just didn't bring it that time. That's entirely possible. The The lack of uh, the watch being in the room, the absence of the watch and cash being in the room, doesn't say that they were stolen. It just says that they weren't there. We don't know if they were never there. Or if it was stolen, it might have been. We, we know that a chambermaid walked in that morning and found his sure. body. If she sees cash and a watch lying out, maybe she got I don't want to make any accusations, but there's just innocent explanations that, well, explanations don't don't relate to his death. Yes, right? that have nothing she to do with murder. There were then investigators, police, everybody else walking in and out of that room forever. It happens in every country that sometimes law enforcement, sometimes officials investigating things sort of, you know, I don't know, take a little bit on the sly. It happens all the time. Listen, it's a long way from murder, though. <laughs> right, it's a long way from now, murder. Now, the last uh, point was this footprint, which right. she says she heard that there was a lone footprint that didn't match David Carradine's. We have to take this with a grain of salt. This mention of the footprint doesn't exist anywhere in a published report by the Thai authorities. It's something that Anderson heard from somebody else or says she heard from somebody else and then is putting a lot of emphasis on it. But you really can't put too much stock in it because 
it doesn't appear anywhere else. It's just her statement. And without more, you can't really build a whole case out of a footprint. And let's not forget, I mean, we don't want to cast too many aspersions against Maria Anderson. I, I believe that she believes these theories that she's throwing out there. And there is some evidence to suggest it. I mean, the, the money and the watch, I think, are, are pretty good that sure. she knows he always traveled with this and it wasn't there. But let's also not forget, she wrote a book. And she was doing the podcast that we heard earlier in which she's promoting that book. And you sell books by saying things that others haven't thought of, saying things that are interesting, that create some sort of, you know, conspiracy, some sort of reasons for things that are happening that we haven't thought of before. So I'm not saying, again, that she's making it up at all. I think that she really does believe what she's saying, but it just doesn't seem to add up a little Occam's razor happening here? Yeah, I mean, where does this all leave us? Here's the facts. Um, Occam's razor, which Jason refers to, is that the simplest explanation is often the correct explanation. David Carradine died in some very, very unusual circumstances, and people have grafted a lot of conspiracy theories onto those. Look, he did die in fishnet stockings. There was a wig involved. He was in a closet. His hands were bound. People want to see intrigue and scandal in that and they don't want to take the simple explanation of he was a man who enjoyed autoerotic autoeroticism and maybe pushed it too far in this one instance and that's really what it seems like happened i mean every other theory of murder suicide all of these other things that were floated around just ultimately don't map, map on to the facts as we know them well you said that it's, he died in a very interesting way it's interesting to you and to me and probably to most people but to david carradine it's a very routine way this yeah. is a practice that he had we know from his earlier that his wife that he had once almost died from this. This is something that he did. And he had a number of hours alone in this hotel room and really tragically it went south on him. I think that'll do it. I think I will I'll leave you with one last message of this has subsumed everything about David Carradine. And yeah. there is something unfortunate about that. He is from a very proud acting tradition. He was tremendous in Kill Bill. I have fond memories of watching those movies without sort of thinking about any of these things. But he exists now in the popular culture as the man who died of autoerotic asphy asphyxiation. And there's something unfortunate and unfair it about is. that. He, he actually spent, mo and he talked at length about this, spent most of his acting career trying to get out from under the shadow of Kung Fu. He was so known for this one thing, pigeonhole as an actor who had done Kung Fu as a very young man. And actually, Kill Bill fed into that. He played a very, he sort of played the older version of the character he played in Kung Fu. And so he spends all these years trying to get out from under the shadow. His second most famous work after Kung Fu kind of feeds into it. And then the thing that finally got him over that edge was the way in which he died. And he was never able to appreciate a life post Kung Fu, post Kill Bill. Yeah. And instead, what everybody thinks now is just the tragic way in which he died. Sad. We'll see you next time.